The news is propaganda. We're being lied to. You hear that all the time, usually from folks labeled, often unfairly, as conspiracy theorists by the corporate press. But the news can't be propaganda. It's not like they're all colluding in a room somewhere. Competing networks and papers often call each other out and are brutally critical of their rivals' reporting. Well, it doesn't take a conspiracy. According to Noam Chomsky, journalists could be convinced they're doing the right thing, unaware that they're serving powerful and bloodthirsty interests. In Manufacturing Consent, Chomsky and Edward S. Herman provide a model by which the media in liberal democracies serves the interests of those in power and silences dissenting voices. Before it's seen fit to present to the public, information has to pass through five filters. The first filter is the size, concentrated ownership, owner wealth, and profit orientation of the dominant mass media firms. The second is advertising as the primary income source of the mass media. The third is the reliance of the media on information provided by the government, business, and experts funded and approved by these primary sources and agents of power. The fourth is flack as a means of disciplining the media. The fifth is anti-communism as a national religion and control mechanism. These elements interact with and reinforce one another. While Manufacturing Consent was published in 1988, its ideas are still relevant today. However, the rise of alternative media has presented new challenges to this old model. I'll address these at the end of the video. Let's examine each one of the five filters individually. Today, nearly every bit of content you consume is owned by six companies. You've got more options today than ever before. Any movie you want to see, any episode of whatever show you've missed, can be streamed in a few clicks. But the platforms on which you consume this media are far less diverse. Disney, Sony, Comcast, Time Warner, and News Corp own pretty much all of the TV, film, music, print, and online media you encounter. In this video, we're talking about the news and how it functions as propaganda. While the First Amendment guarantees, at least in theory, that we can say anything we want, news outlets are incentivized to report in certain ways by their business model. That's because these networks and papers are supported, in whole or in part, by advertising. Before the press took on the unbiased and objective tone we saw in the 20th century, journalists didn't hide their politics. Papers were put out by political parties or workers' organizations or other groups interested in spreading their views to the public. Technological change made it possible for papers to be printed rapidly and disseminated over far greater spaces. This, of course, was expensive, and successful papers relied on advertisements to offset the cost of production. I mean, it was the period of uh, the freest press in the United States was probably uh, over a century ago uh, before the effect of capital concentration and uh, advertising support, and there were free and vibrant media uh, reflecting many different opinions, a lot of public participation, a lot of engagement. In fact, the founding fathers uh, devised techniques to ensure that media would flourish. Uh, the First Amendment was regarded as uh, uh, not just uh, protecting to a limited degree uh, freedom of the press, but it was also meant to encourage it, because it was taken for granted that diverse, uh, independent, participatory media were a foundation for uh, any viable democracy. In order to gain more advertisers, many papers, in an attempt to reach a wider group of potential customers, dropped their partisan tone in favor of a more objective approach. Those who didn't had to pass along the entire cost of production to their customers. Naturally, they were more expensive, possessed a smaller reach, and were more limited in the stories they reported, so they couldn't compete. In order to get a scoop, a journalist needs someone willing to talk to them. If they want to find out what's going on in a hostile government, for example, they might make contact with a source in a U.S. intelligence agency. Of course, these agencies have their own reasons for providing information, and this can have significant, even deadly, consequences. 
The mainstream press, for example, reported for years that the anthrax attacks after 9-11 were most likely from a lab in Iraq. The truth, at least some of it, eventually came out. The anthrax came from someone in the United States. When the truth eventually emerged, we'd already toppled the Iraqi government and used these attacks as a pretext for invading the Middle Eastern nation. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's terrifying. Quick, before you go, what is the anthrax story from 2001? Because I remember that. I remember how absurd it is. And I want you to just go into that just while I have you here. What is the anthrax story? Because I remember how absurd and ridiculous that was. They all pinned it on one guy and... Yeah. Well, so uh, that's not a easy, that's not a quick uh, thing to answer, um, right. and it's actually really important uh, to go over it. So um, yeah, you have the give time. me a little bit here, because yeah. one of the things we've been hearing a buzzword, we've been hearing a lot lately, is dark winter. Right. Uh, right? It's going to be a dark winter, darkest winter, and all of that. Well, in June 2001, there was a bioterror simulation by uh, what is now the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Health Security, which also did Event 201 last year and things like that. And it was called Dark Winter, and it, it included former CIA directors, former FBI directors, and a lot of other prominent national security officials, um, and predicted a lot of things that would later come to take place uh, just a couple months later during the anthrax attacks, including anthrax being sent uh, through the mail, that anthrax letters would be received by members of the media, um, and also, the uh, initial narrative of the bioterror attack itself, which was that Saddam Hussein was working with Al-Qaeda to enact bioterror, uh, a bioterror attack on the U.S. This was all gamed out in June 2001, and then the anthrax attacks were revealed to the public in October 2001. And that was the initial narrative, that it was, gonna, that it was uh, anthrax from Iraq, um, and that Al-Qaeda had been involved in, in all of this stuff. Uh, of course, it later was revealed that the anthrax used in the attacks was a, a, a strain exclusive to the U.S. military and had to have come from either a U.S. military lab or a U.S. military contractor. So the whole narrative that it must have been Iraq and Al-Qaeda eventually started to fall apart. But a lot of people that had been involved in Dark Winter uh, tried to run with that narrative for as long as possible. And what's also important is that in the period between September 11th and when the anthrax attacks actually took place, a lot of these people that had been involved in Dark Winter, like Jerome Howard, for example, uh, had uh, apparent foreknowledge that anthrax was going to take place. So you have, for example, um, Jerome Howard on the day of 9-11 uh, telling people that they need to start taking uh, an antibiotic to prevent anthrax infection. This was going on at Dick Cheney's office uh, in, in particular. And then just a couple days after 9-11, Dick Cheney was personally briefed by the people that created the Dark Winter exercise about Dark Winter. Um, and all of this stuff. And then you have a bunch of the Project for a New American Century think tank neocons, uh, of which Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were members, going on national media saying anthrax, uh, talking about anthrax uh, constantly. You also had a member of the media that was at Dark Winter, Judith Miller, uh, being involved in writing several articles uh, between September 11th and when the anthrax attacks took place, talking about how uh, talking about anthrax and bioterror, Al-Qaeda and anthrax and all of this stuff, sort of seeding this narrative, and those attacks end up uh, taking place. And um, what's really crazy, too, about anthrax is the FBI investigation itself, which was called Amerithrax. Um, it took them almost a decade to officially close that case. It's been hu it was hugely criticized, not just by people uh, at the National Academy of Sciences, but also by one of the lead investigators of the investigation for the FBI itself, their lead investigator, Richard Lambert, actually ended up filing a whistleblower lawsuit saying that the FBI's investigation into the anthrax attacks was a giant cover-up. And that's from the guy that was investigating it for the FBI itself. Uh, they pinned it on Bruce Ivins before they could take it to trial. Bruce Ivins committed suicide, even though he was under 24-7 uh, FBI surveillance. Uh, and so they didn't actually have to prove their case against him in court because he uh, conveniently dies right before they take it to trial. Even though Iraq didn't end up having weapons of mass destruction, it was a story that kept folks tuned in. The American and Iraqi people lost, but news networks, the advertisers supporting them, and the military industrial complex profited. If someone in public life steps out of line, expressing views that, whether true or not, influence enough people to question the information presented by the corporate media, they receive flack. 
We can see this quite clearly, for example, in the case of Donald Trump. Put aside whatever political views you have, it doesn't matter if you think he's the greatest living patriot or a threat to the Republic. Whether you believe he deserves to be in jail or in the Oval Office, I think you'll agree that Trump was viewed very, very differently before his run for president. Trump's opponents often call him a racist and indecent toward women. However you feel about his character, it's clear that the media goes to bat for others who express views one might consider racist. In Delaware, the largest growth in population is Indian Americans moving from India. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent to fully... I'm not joking. Oh, gigantic and who commit certain forms of misconduct as long as they support views in line with establishment thinking. So what was it then that got Donald Trump on the media's bad side? Perhaps it's words like these. I'm not saying the military is in love with me, the soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. The powers that be can't have that, so they have to appeal to America's sense of moral outrage. Look too at what Hillary Clinton, who never served in the military, says of Tulsi Gabbard. I'm not making any predictions, but I think they've got their eye on somebody who's currently in the Democratic primary and are grooming her to be the third party candidate. She's the favorite of the Russians. They have a bunch of, you know, sites and bots and other uh, ways of supporting her so far. Uh, and I, I'm, that, that's assuming Jill Stein will give it up, which she might not, because she's also a Russian uh, asset. And Mitt Romney, also not a veteran, went so far as to call Gabbard a traitor. Why? Because she questioned the narratives provided to journalists by intelligence agencies. In this clip, we'll see Gabbard criticize Trump's strikes against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. While Trump was peaceful in comparison to Bush or Obama, he carried out his fair share of extra-constitutional military actions. Let's talk about this chemical attack. Uh, you tweeted uh, about the attack, and I'll put it up. On the screen, you, you tweeted this, whoever is found responsible, be it the Syrian government, Al-Qaeda or ISIS, all have access to chemical weapons, must be held accountable. Who do you believe is responsible for that chemical attack that killed so many civilians, including so many ch children? Here's the issue, Wolf, is what I believe, what you believe or others believe is irrelevant. What matters here is the evidence and the facts. Uh, if President Assad is found to be responsible after an independent investigation for these horrific chemical weapons attacks. I'll be the first one to denounce him, to call him a war criminal, and to call for his prosecution, the International Criminal Court, make sure that those consequences are there. But the key is now with President Trump's reckless uh, military strikes last night, uh, it flew directly in the face of the action that the UN was working on at that time to launch an independent investigation, to find out exactly what the facts are, who was involved and who was responsible, so that the appropriate uh, consequences could be levied. So, Congresswoman, when the Pentagon says it was the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad who was responsible, or the Secretary of State says that, the President says that, uh, they all conclude that they have the evidence to back it up. They say Assad did it, his military did it. You don't believe them necessarily. Well, last time I checked, Wolf, Congress had the authority and the responsibility for declaring war, for authorizing the use of military force. So whether the president or the Pentagon or the Secretary of State says that they have the evidence, the fact remains that they have not brought that evidence before Congress, they have not brought that evidence before the American people, and they have not sought authorization from Congress to launch this military attack on another country. The fact is that the United States has been waging this war, this regime change war now for years, covertly through the CIA to overthrow the Syrian government. The result of this has been the suffering 
of, of the Syrian people, hundreds of thousands of people dead, millions of refugees, and the strengthening of terrorist groups in Syria, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, whose goal is to overthrow the Syrian government. So this escalation that President Trump took yesterday in launching this military attack continues this so, illegal, unconstitu unconstitutional war. Manufacturing consent was published when the USSR was still a country. Today, the Soviet Union is no longer seen as an existential threat to America, mainly because it doesn't exist. What the propaganda model needs in order for it to function properly is an enemy. In the Bush years, we were fighting the ideology of Islamic terrorism. While Bush eventually experienced a great deal of criticism, though not nearly as much as he deserved, both parties seemed almost wholly committed to fighting an ideology they found unambiguously evil. And let's look at what happens when Mos Def asks where he can find information on what Al-Qaeda believes, in their own words. Mencken, we talked about Mencken earlier. Mencken had this wonderful line about Puritanism when he said that Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. You know, and, 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 and I think that what you've got here is, a, is an ultra-Puritan agenda which tries to crush, I mean, music, forget about it, illegal. Illegal. I understand. Right? I'm um, just saying, is dancing, there any place illegal. where you can go read? This is who we are, illegal. and this is what we want. Has Books, it been clearly illegal. defined or you vocalized know, any place you. on the world on the world stage? Or is this? Is this? This is. They clearly say it. I mean, the Taliban leadership has said music is against Islam. No, no, no. Books I understand. I mean, those Islam. are those are um, those are finer points that you know, you know, Those what they concerned. don't or don't do, Not do or don't right. like. Don't I'm trying to find out what is their main political objective and aim and have they, they ever well, vocalized it again, on, it Let me put it in a simple way. The restoration of the caliphate. Of, they're trying of to Los create Los a fascist Islam. state, put it in English. Right. No. And also, bin Laden has said many times he wanted to bankrupt America and he also want, thought it was a duty for every Muslim to control nuclear weapons, to get their hands on nuclear weapons. So they have, they, they put it out, they, he, he drops a lot of... And to kill all Jews, all Hindus, all secularists, they've only got me twice so far. Yeah. Right. That's uh, what, I mean, well, all, 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 all I can say is that if, a group, all, all if a group has this type of... Uh, They're bad. Well, They're bad motherfuckers. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I'm, I'm just telling. Yeah, well, I'm not saying I'm not wearing the Al-Qaeda t-shirt. You sound as if the whole... I'm trying to get an understanding. You're sounding, you're wait, wait, wait. I don't... Wait, no, 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 no. You're listen. sounding as if you only just heard of that. No, I'm not sounding like that you're at all. I'm, asking, he asked I'm a good asking for question. points to be sounding edified. Bewildered right. Right. No, no, no. I'm not bewildered. I'm not... I don't take my information from the news. I don't just believe that somebody is bad because CNN or you or you or you said so. No, no but this is coming from... I think for myself. From, 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 well, let me ask you. Well, let me ask you. I asked a question because I wasn't clear. Let's see some evidence of that. Okay. Let's see some evidence of that. What do you mean? I said, let's see some evidence of that. You say you've got no reason of your own to dislike Al-Qaeda. If I had I didn't say that at all. I asked the them to edify yeah. what was their political objective. That's what I said. And I didn't asking, say I, I know we should believe that. You're asking because you don't know. Because it's never, been, ex I, it's never been explained to me. The only thing that's been said is the listen. But, all right. Wait, wait, let me, wait, but let me finish. Let, let, let me finish. You I haven't, let say, me start. I, you haven't watched a Bin Laden video. You've never right. watched. You're telling me. Right. It is. Listen, well I don't speak you Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, and I don't. I don't trust the media, so I don't just trust have, everything that comes I think, over the I think airwaves. I, I, I know say exactly again. where you're coming from. No, you haven't watched one. You haven't watched. Uh, no, he's saying he press. doesn't believe the you, translation. Watch it, watch I don't believe the translation. Watch it, watch I don't speak Arabic. Watch it like so me. All I ask a simple watch question. it like me with an Arab-speaking friend. Look at a, look at a decent translation. You're telling me all this is new to you. I you don't know or believe any of it, Mr. Hitchens. What I said as I asked the question is what was. Al Qaeda's political well, objective. What was their this, aim? And this, has it ever been clearly defined? That's it. You've already yes. told me that you wouldn't take it just from me. Yes. Okay. Already, no, I, I wouldn't. I why wouldn't just take it from of, just anybody. You, of, you wouldn't just take this any information work, from me. Do a bit of work on your own account. Sure. I, I do do work on my own account. Mr. I don't start no shit, I, Mr. Hitchens. I'm from Brooklyn. Mr. Definitely. I'm not afraid of nothing. Mr. Definitely, I'm from I'm from Hampshire. Well, then congratulations. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? We're both from planet Earth, It's very unwise. I'm not, I'm not a lazy thinker. very figure. unwise. I mean, I, 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 unwise I, I, like to, I like to make assumptions. I, I like to think on my own. I don't like to think based on what we're the earth waiting, is thinking. We're just waiting to or see. I, I, I'm, I'm strong enough to hold the unpopular we're ideas. We're just waiting to see evidence that you do that. For all their snarky rhetoric, I don't think they ever offer a satisfactory answer to his question. 
but they do give a small taste of the flack a public figure might receive if he steps outside the bounds of acceptable opinion. Chomsky's propaganda model and the mainstream media that employs it have experienced a considerable shakeup in recent years, catalyzed by the Trump presidency. The idea of an objective press these days seems like a nostalgic pipe dream. Let's hear Matt Taibbi talk about why this change occurred. In his new book, Hate Inc., Why Today's Media Makes Us Despise One Another, journalist Matt Taibbi digs into the impact of the 24-hour news cycle and how the definition of news has in fact changed. He joins us now via Skype for an in-depth discussion on what he found. Matt. Good day. Great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Tiger. How are you doing? Oh, well, we're, we're doing great now that you're here. But, <laughs> Matt, you wrote this book. You, you received widespread acclaim whenever you released one of the chapters uh, right after the Mueller report came out. What, what would you say is the central thesis of the book for our viewers? I know that you wanted it to write it as a successor to Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky. Yeah, I mean, this is a book of media criticism. It's um, it's about a subject I think a lot of people in the business talk about uh, privately, but we haven't we don't discuss publicly a lot, which is that the commercial imperatives of the business have changed kind of dramatically in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. You know, my father was a reporter. You know, back in his day, the media was searching for the entire audience, so we had very specific strategies that were not intended to wind up people. Now, the the, the basic idea is similar to what Fox pioneered in the 90s, which is we're not going for everybody, we're going for a piece or a half of the demographic and we're trying to dominate it by giving them news that we know that they're going to like or agree with and typically that's usually involves giving them bad news about some other group, whether it's liberals or, uh, you know, for Fox, the Fox audience or Republicans on, you know, the MSNBC side. And that, mm -hmm. that strategy is very profitable, but it has some deleterious effects to the population. Yeah. Well, and one of the core insights that you offer in this book that was something that hadn't completely crystallized for me is that the point of all these stupid minor squabbles over like celebrity news or whether Trump used the example of Trump forgetting to mention yeah. John McCain <laughs> when he's just signed this massive expansion of our military and that's what they focus on the slight of McCain rather than the malice, massive increase in the military that all these little squabbles serve to keep us from asking bigger more structural questions that would actually be a threat to the establishment in the way that things are done in the country. Yeah, I mean, I think the example you bring up, that, that's, that's, that's a classic case of, of how this works. You, you take any news story, and what we're trying to do typically in commercial media is we, we take something that happens, and then we want to commoditize it into packages that we know our respective audiences are going to like. So you take the, the, news, the, the military budget from 2018, which had the single largest one-year increase in our history. It was $82 billion, which is roughly the equivalent of a year of the Iraq war. Um, and rather than focus on that and everything that's in the bill, which, you know, included new forms of nuclear weapons, we divided it into stories that were e for easy consumption on either side. So the Democrats and the MSNBC, they talked a lot about Trump failing to mention John McCain, whose name was in the bill when he signed the bill. And this was another instance right. of him being insulting. Well, his Republicans talked about how Democrats were scheming to take the wall funding out of the bill. And again, these were minor things compared to the, the larger question of what's actually in the military budget and why is it going up so high. New media, especially in the online video and podcast space, has broadened popular discourse. Certainly these creators have received plenty of flack from the legacy media, but the audience for new media has grown enough that it can compete with and sometimes conquer its old school competitors. And many YouTubers, for example, are working for themselves, at least in concept. But the platform they post on is owned by Alphabet, which owns Google, which is about as big business as you can get. What about advertising? Just like their legacy media counterparts, those working in new media, once they achieve an audience substantial enough to generate income, are dependent on ad revenue, sponsors, and audience subscriptions. If you make a video where you say certain words or offer a take that goes against the YouTube guidelines, your channel could be demonetized or deleted entirely. If your sponsors aren't happy with what you're saying or how you represent their product, they can drop you. I want you to sign up for Dollar Shave Club by going to dollarshaveclub.com forward slash norm. You will get high quality razors sent to your door. <laughs> That's not, come on. It's a little frightening. 
Is it a dollar a day for one here. razor? No, 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 no. Why no, no. why they call it dollar shave? Huh? Dollar a month? <laughs> Listen, man, I can't answer every question. It's called Dollar Shave Club. Yes, that means it costs you a dollar $1 over $1 the course of your lifetime. They can't be high quality razors for well, one dollar a month. They're the highest quality razors in the world. You can <laughs> slit your wife's throat. It's somewhere in between. I, no, I also, we, all, we also have to take a break. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it says it right on the monitor. We have no really? sponsors. And if you say something that alienates you from your audience, you could lose subscribers, which will affect your views, ad revenue, and sponsorship deals. New media is certainly freer with all the features and bugs this freedom comes with, but creators are still constrained. Still, it seems as though things are moving in the right direction. There are plenty of complaints, usually originating from legacy media, that new media peddles disinformation. This, they say, is dangerous. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish and publish these same stories that simply aren't true without, without checking facts first. first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms, platforms to push their, their own personal bias and agenda, agenda to control it. Exactly. That's certainly true, but I can't think of a more dangerous case of disinformation than lying a nation into war, leaving untold dead in the process. So, while new media does some things better than the old guard, legacy media steals the show when it comes to fake news.